In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome to the program entitled, Learning to Live in God's Divine Will. Last week, the theme of growth in the Divine Will was addressed through four degrees. To remain faithful to that theme, we will continue again to elaborate on the unending degrees of living in God's divine will. According to the mystical doctors of the Church, there are four stages of growth with God's will, and that is purification, which is a human way of acting, thinking, and praying that requires refinement. And the refinement is the work of the Holy Spirit who purges the soul of its human mode, of its human way of thinking, acting, and praying. And St. Teresa of Avila, the mystical doctor of the Church, devotes four mansions to this mode of purification, to this first stage of the soul in its pursuit of holiness and desire to grow in union with God's will. We are not yet at the stage of living in God's divine will, but doing God's will. So the soul seeks to unite itself with God's will in this mode or stage of purification. And then the Holy Spirit leads the soul to a second stage or mode known as illumination. So let's take a child or a young adolescent who thinks and acts and prays for its own interests. Take a little infant, for example, when it doesn't get what it wants, what does it do if not hold its breath and stamp its feet until the parent concedes its request? Well, that's the human mode. It's very juvenile. Still in the egocentric method, but it's moving to the altrocentric method and it's moving toward illumination. And the Holy Spirit does this work of progressing the soul with the soul's cooperation from its egotism to its altruism. And at this stage, the Holy Spirit begins to illuminate its mind. Hence this method called illumination, this mode, this stage. And St. Teresa of Avila devotes the fifth and sixth mansions to this second stage of illumination. And as the soul progresses from purification to illumination, it enters what's called a unification with God's will. And in this stage, St. Teresa speaks in the seventh mansion of the soul espousing God. John of the Cross refers to these three stages as well, of purification, illumination, and unification in his four works. And we're still at the stage of the soul doing the will of God. You may say, it's doing its own will in the first method of, or the first mode of purification. It's doing God's will imperfectly in the second stage of illumination, and it's doing God's will perfectly in the third stage of unification, where the Holy Spirit not only purifies and illumines the soul, but now unites it with the Son and the Father in itself. And here is where spiritual growth in the writings of the mystical doctors ends. But... St. John of the Cross was humble enough to add in his writings that if there should be an ulterior stage in spiritual growth with the Trinity that is not accessible to us now, we should welcome it. And little did these mystical doctors of the Church, John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila, know that God did withhold an ulterior stage that in our time has been dispensed, outpoured, and actualized in human nature. We may refer to this fourth stage, that is the stage that follows purification, 
illumination, and unification as divinization. Now, this theme of divinization has been um, often written of and spoken of in the Eastern Orthodox Church. You know, before the schism in 1054, the East and West were united. And the Greek fathers spoke often about divinization. The Latin writers seldom ever mention that word. And we in the West are predominantly influenced by the scholastics, the Latin writers, not the Greeks, the patristics, but the scholastics. So our theology, in a way, after this, you know, say the split in 1054, has been impaired because we lost this great patrimony of Eastern theology. But we really didn't lose it. We neglected to teach it in our catechism in the West, and we should not have. Because divinization is essential to learning and knowing about how the Holy Spirit brings about this ulterior stage of union with the Trinity. Even though the Greek writers spoke of this far more often than the Latin writers, they never said that they experienced it. You see, they spoke of how Adam and Eve lived this in the stage of divinization. They spoke of how God can bring it about. But no one has said in the Greek world that this stage of divinization has found its completion in me. And yet, their writings paved the way for us today to understand better Louisa's writings. Because in Louisa's writings, we find the actualization, the completion of this teaching of the Greek fathers, namely divinization. And in the stage of divinization, the Holy Spirit restores to human nature, in particular to the soul, and in particular to the human will of the, of the soul, the completion of God's one eternal operation with the finite human operation, producing or establishing a synergetic operation. Now, when I use the word synergetic, I have to be careful because I don't intend to mean there's one operation here. There's not, there's two. There's the human and the divine. God is one eternal operation, and it's a, a divine operation. But we, in our human finite operation, cooperate with God's one eternal divine operation. And the Holy Spirit brings about this unification of the two wills operating like one, hence the word synergetic operation. They're distinct, like the Trinity, like the presence of the Trinity, but inseparable in their operation. Now, when I use the word inseparable, I'm not using it in the beatific sense of the word, meaning that the souls who operate inseparably from God's will are impeccable, or that they are in the beatific mode. They're not. They're in the intuitive mode, still here below on earth. But when they operate with God's one eternal will, that the Holy Spirit is actualizing in these end times, in this new ulterior stage of divinization, they are free to say yes or no to God, whereas in heaven, in the beatific mode, they're not. They cannot sin in heaven, but we can sin on earth. Certainly when the soul arrives at the very last stage, or degree, I should say, of union with God's will, when the soul arrives at this last principal degree of union with God's will, Jesus tells Louisa that it does not want to sin. It's sort of like, it's so united with God, it's so anchored in the virtues, that it has been exercising for several years, and it is so enamored with God's interests and possessed by the Holy Spirit 
You know, if the devil can possess someone, so much more may the Holy Spirit possess someone. You see, God can possess greater an individual than Satan can, who's a creature. God is the creator. So we should not fear saying the Holy Spirit possesses people. I understand people don't tend to use that word because possession sounds like something against the individual's will, which is very diabolic. God never imposes himself on the free human will. Satan does. But once the Holy Spirit is invited by the soul who freely invokes him, then he can indeed possess the soul. There are many saints in the church that were possessed by the Holy Spirit. And we call them mystical doctors. We call them mystics. We call them prophets. Like Saint Faustina Kowalska, the servant of God Luisa Picareta, Saint Padre Pio Pietralcina, Saint Maximilian Kolbe, Blessed Dina Belanger, Venerable Concepcion Cabrera de Armida, the servant of God, Father Walter Chiswick, Mother Saint Mother Teresa of Calcutta, Saint Pope John Paul II, Blessed Elizabeth of the Holy Trinity. The list goes on. And in this stage of divinization, where the Holy Spirit possesses the intellect, the memory and the will of the individual, who invites the Holy Spirit to possess him or herself, we encounter four principal degrees of living in the divine will. Now, the key adjective here again is principle, and we addressed this last week. There are not four degrees of living in the divine will. They are not. There are four principal degrees, and I will explain why we cannot say there are just four degrees. <clears throat> well, because when we say there are four degrees, we imply that once we arrive at the fourth degree, there, there are no other degrees, and that's not true. And in fact, even though Jesus uses the word four degrees with, in Louise's writings, we have to understand what he means by this expression. He doesn't mean there are four degrees and no more. And this is evident in various excerpts of Louisa's writings where Jesus tells her the degrees never end. They're, they are unending degrees in my will, on earth and in heaven, because the soul never ceases to grow in union with God, who is eternal. And inasmuch as God is eternal, the soul's pursuit of, him, of union with him is also eternal. Eternity has no end, you see. And the soul is always fought growing in God without end, and that is the mystery of eternity. And this is why, <clears throat> when I was once asked, how do we obtain the fourth degree in God's will? And my, my response was, the degrees are unending. There are four principal degrees, you see. <clears throat> and theologically, saying four degrees is really not quite correct. Because if you say there are four degrees, you have to say there is no fifth degree, no sixth degree. And there is. Jesus tells Louisa this, and I will share this with you. So really, the, theologically, now Jesus used simple words with Louisa. But theology does not use simple words. So theologically, the word should be not four degrees, but rather Four stages, four stages of living in God's divine will. And these stages are principal degrees, not just degrees, they're principal degrees. And the first stage is living outside the kingdom, which I explained last week. <coughs> Excuse me. The second stage is living on the periphery of the kingdom. The third is entering the kingdom, and the fourth, living in the kingdom. And the soul grows in degrees in the kingdom. It starts with desire. Its desire is the first step. It must desire God's will. However, imperfectly, with what little knowledge it may have. <coughs> Excuse me. 
So the soul may have an imperfect knowledge of God's gift when it starts to desire it. We all do. So desire is the first ingredient to the recipe of living in God's will. The second recipe, ingredient, sorry, is knowledge. So while it's desiring to live in God's will, its knowledge is being perfected, and its knowledge perfects its desire. They work hand in hand. Consider knowledge the rudder of a boat that directs its course, and desire the motor that empowers its body, which is the boat, to obtain the purpose of that course, its objective, which is placing the vessel in port. The third ingredient is virtues, is virtue. So the soul must exercise the virtues. It can't just simply be content with knowing God's will without doing anything. The desire and the knowledge work together to produce concrete acts, divine acts in God's will. And these acts are the fruit of the soul's virtue. There can be no divine acts without the exercise of Christian virtue. But then God's will assists the soul in perfecting the virtues in this stage of divinization. And we may say, in these four principal degrees of living in God's will, by endowing its Christian virtues with divine virtues. These are the angelic virtues. Whereby the soul, in its prayers, in its exercise of patience, charity, sacrifice, temperance, moderation, fortitude, piety, counsel, understanding, wisdom, knowledge, and the list goes on. Faith, hope, love, right? These are the theological virtues also. While the Holy Spirit, while the soul is exercising these virtues, God endows its exercise of the virtues with his own divine and eternal qualities, which are known as divine virtues. So the Christian virtues receive an endowment from the Holy Spirit that enables its Christian virtues to become universal, impacting all things of all time. This is the result of God endowing its Christian virtues with divine virtues. And the fourth ingredient of the soul's pursuit of holiness and union with God's will in the stage of divinization is life. So it progresses from desire to knowledge to virtue to life. Desire admits the soul to the periphery of the kingdom of the divine will. Knowledge advances the soul in this kingdom, allows the soul to enter it and to grow in it through the exercise of the virtues as well. Till finally the soul lives in the kingdom and here we have a life, the fourth ingredient. So we may say that the four principal degrees of the soul being outside the kingdom to entering the periphery of the kingdom, to entering the kingdom itself, to finally living in the kingdom, correspond to desire, knowledge, virtue, and life. And Jesus also speaks in Louisa's writings of steps of light in the divine will. And he mentions different steps. These four stages of or degrees of the soul being outside of the kingdom to entering the periphery of the kingdom, to entering the kingdom itself, to finally living in the kingdom, correspond to the four steps of the soul's desire, knowledge, virtue, and life. So these four principal degrees, outside the kingdom, on the periphery of the kingdom, entering the kingdom, and living in the kingdom, we may say, correspond to its desire, knowledge, virtue, and life. Now, Jesus speaks of steps of light in the divine will. And he says the first step of light the soul takes is desire, you see. The soul must desire and yearn for the divine will with firmness. 
And this yearning is important for growth. We don't really give much attention to the word yearning. And yet it's biblical. Paul speaks of, uses this word in his 10th chapter to the Romans. When he says that all creation groans, yearns for the manifestation of the children of God, the sons of God, in order to be set free from its slavery to corruption. And this yearning we must also have, this groaning for God's divine will to reign in our thoughts, in our words, and in our actions. And should we fail from time to time or miss the mark, we are not to despair but to run, run to God with confidence in his trust and forgiveness. Remember, God trusts us more than we trust him. He trusts the grace that he has put within us to accomplish within us perfectly this work of sanctification. God knows what he is doing with us, and we don't always know that. So we distrust ourselves, and sometimes we distrust his, his grace. And when we miss the mark from time to time in living in God's will, let us not despair. But with trust, as Jesus tells Faustina, run to the, he calls it the throne of grace, which is confession. And there be renewed and reemerge ourselves in the ocean of his will that consumes all imperfections, shortcomings, and sins. And the second step of light in the divine will is beginning to act in it. So the first step of light is desiring and yearning for the divine will with firmness that the soul takes in God's divine will. And the second step of light is the soul's actions in the divine will. It begins to act. And again, these two steps of light in the divine will that God speaks about to Louisa are found in these four practical steps of desire, knowledge, virtue, and life. As I mentioned earlier, desire is of the will. Knowledge is of the intellect. Two faculties of the soul being engaged. But virtue is putting into practice desire and knowledge together. And this is where the soul begins to act, perform its divine acts in the divine will, that when repeated over time, lead it to life. The fourth step in the divine will. So the four practical steps are desire, knowledge, virtue, and life. And the two steps of light that Jesus speaks to Louisa of are desire and yearning for the divine will with firmness, and two, beginning to act in the divine will. Otherwise put, Jesus gives Louisa different analogies, different examples of how to grow in the divine will. He first gives her four, pra four practical steps. Then he gives her two steps of light. And then he talks about unending degrees in his will, which is what I'd like to share with you today. Let's first speak of the imperfect, the perfect, and the complete way of the soul living in the divine will, which exemplifies growth in degrees, unending degrees. He tells Louisa in volume 11 on June 29, 1940, My beloved daughter, the sea symbolizes my immensity, while the objects, different in size, in the sea symbolize the souls who live in my will but with different ways of living. Some live on the surface, others below the surface, and yet others live completely in my will. And they all vary according to how they live in my will. Some souls live in my will in an imperfect way. Let's pause here. You know, some works have been put out on the divine will, and they're not quite accurate because they teach that we must live like Louisa lived in order to live in the divine will, or we don't live in it at all. And that's not true. 
some other teachings that are not correct state that no one lives in the divine will on earth, or unless the Pope makes a declaration that this gift is authentic, no one can receive this gift. This is not true either, because we know that Mary lived in the divine will, Jesus lived in the divine will, Louisa lived in the divine will, and other saints have lived in the divine will that I mentioned in my work approved by two Catholic bishops entitled The Splendor of Creation. I list about 12 individuals that have lived in the divine without without any shadow of doubt. And how do I know this? Because of their writings, because of their visitations and confirmations of Jesus that they did. But even though we may not attain to such a high degree of union with God's will as these saints did, it doesn't mean that we're not living in it. There are different ways of living. Some live in perfectly, others perfectly, and others completely. So you see, there is hope. And there is therefore no reason for us to judge each other or, or analyze or observe and try to Wag the finger saying, oh, that person just had a chocolate or an ice cream. They just left the divine will. That's silly. There's nothing sinful about having chocolate or ice cream. But there are different degrees and different times in which we do things. And sometimes, actually, it's more virtuous out of charity to eat something that someone has prepared than to say, no, today I'm fasting. Certainly, there's a time for both. And charity dictates when. Now, of these four principal degrees of living outside the kingdom, on the periphery of the kingdom, entering within the kingdom, and living in the kingdom, we may add more degrees. So, of these four degrees, we may add more. And we find this in the writings of Louisa. Once the soul moves from an imperfect to a perfect, to a complete way of living in his will, as he mentions in volume 11, the soul continues to grow in the divine will. Jesus tells Louisa, for example, this comes from volume 30, February 6th, 1932. My daughter, each time you form an act of yours in the act of my divine will. See, there are two operations here. Louise's actions and God's act. God doesn't have actions in the plural. He has an act, one eternal act. So he tells her, each time you form an act of yours in the act of my will, you form many bonds. And for as many bonds you form in the divine will, you remain more confirmed in it. For as many acts you do in the divine will, so many more times does the divine will remain confirmed in you. And for each bond and confirmation that you obtain, my will expands its seas around you. And as a confirmation and as a seal, it issues forth one of its truths, a manifestation of additional knowledge. And it manifests to you one more degree of value that my will contains. You see, one more degree. Every time she does an act, she grows in a degree. But do you know, he tells Louisa, what these additional bonds, confirmations, truths, manifestations of knowledge and values that you come to know do in your soul? They make the life of my will grow in you. See, with each each act, additional act Louisa does in God's will, she receives an additional degree of growth. They make the life of my will grow in you. Not only do they do this, but when you repeat your acts in the divine will, they grow in many more degrees. See that? This comes again from volume 30. February 6, 1932. So Louisa's growing in unending degrees beyond the fourth degree, you see. And Jesus revealed this to Louisa in 1932. This is 32 years after she received the divine will in its complete way. 
Remember, the fourth degree is living completely in God's will. The third degree is living perfectly. The second degree is living perfectly, imperfectly rather. And the first is not living. So Louisa attained the complete fourth degree of living in God's will on November 16th, 1900 at the age of 35. Here he speaks to her 32 years later, after she lived completely in the fourth degree, and he's telling her you're still growing in degrees. You see? So those who say there are only four degrees of living in the divine will are incorrect. I understand these are the words Jesus used to Louisa, but what he's intending to say is not once you attain the fourth degree, growth stops. It never stops. You continue to grow in degrees. What he's saying is that there are four principal degrees. And once you've attained that principal degree, theologically the correct word would be stages. Once you've attained this fourth stage, you continue to grow in degrees in that fourth stage. So Jesus tells Louisa again, every time you do an act of your will in my will, My will makes you grow in many more degrees. Your acts are placed on the scale of the divine value, and they are worth as much as you have known and for as much value as has been communicated with within your act by us, the Trinity. So your act of yesterday, Louisa, as you repeat it today, does not have the same value of yesterday, for it has acquired the new value that we, the Trinity, have made known to you. Therefore, the repetition of your acts, accompanied by new truths that we manifest to you, new knowledge, day by day, acquires for you new degrees, always increasing of infinite value. Again, read it for yourself. Volume 30th, volume 30, February 6, 1932. So you see, Louisa is still growing in degrees long after, 32 years after she entered the fourth stage, the fourth degree. Jesus also tells her, this comes from volume 30, same volume, February 10th, 1932. Beloved daughter of my will, each time you elevate yourself in my will to unite yourself to each act my will has accomplished and to unite your act to my act, the divine act, rises and gives you a new degree of grace a degree of love, a degree of sanctity, a new degree of divine life and of divine glory. These degrees, united together, form the necessary substance to form the divine life in the creature. One degree forms the heartbeat, another degree forms the breath, another degree forms the word, another degree forms the eye, another degree forms beauty, another sanctity, and so forth, in the depths of the soul. And this is what it means to live in my will, to unclutter oneself of everything and fly into the womb of the Heavenly Father, into the unending light, so that in emptying yourself, uncluttering yourself from everything around you, you may receive life of Him who created the world. Jesus tells Louisa in volume 32 on March 14, 1933, if the soul has been loved by God with special love on one occasion, on three occasions, ten occasions, or a hundred occasions, according to these numbers, the soul acquires so many more degrees of sanctity and therefore glory. You see, and he's telling her this when she's long long experienced, long ago experienced, the stage four of living in his will. This is 1933. She's about, what, 73 years old at this point? But he continues to teach her about the growth in degrees that are unending. He tells her again in volume 28, March 2nd, 1930, Unhappiness, bitterness, weakness, passions do not enter my will, but remain outside of it. 
My will's balsamic air sweetens and fortifies everything, and the more the soul lives in it and repeats its acts in my divine will, the more degrees of happiness, sanctity, strength, and divine beauty the soul acquires. He tells her again in volume 29 on October 30th, 1921. Each word of ours, meaning the Trinity's word, is an outpouring that we make upon creation, and as many degrees of knowledge as the soul acquires by means of our word, so many more degrees of participation the soul receives from her, its creator. Again in volume 22, September 14th, 1927. Jesus tells Louisa, I want your acts, your love, together with that of my mother, and that of all, and that all my acts be followed by your acts, so that I may give to you, too, as many degrees of grace for as many acts you do for me. And then he tells her in volume 11, June 12, 1913. Union with me. Bit by bit. Faculty by faculty. Produces in you, in the highest degree, the life of my will and of my love. In this will, the Father is formed. In this love, the Holy Spirit is formed. And through this operation, that is, the words, the works, the thoughts, everything the soul does, the Son is formed. And here is established the indwelling of the Trinity in souls. So here the Father acquires the role of operating in the soul's will, and the Spirit in its love, and the Son in all of its acts. Elsewhere, Jesus tells Louisa, in Adam, the Father operated in his will, the Son in his intellect, and the Spirit in his memory. And here he tells her the Son is operating in the soul's love, its affection. And the Son in all of the soul's acts, be it the steps it takes, the moves it makes, the thoughts it engages itself in, the breaths it, make, it takes, etc., here the soul is, little by little, through its acts, through its desire, through its love, through the engagement of its intellect, memory, and will, and its bodily faculties as well, allowing the Trinity to form this divine indwelling within it. And Jesus tells Louisa in volume 4, on June 2nd, 1902, My daughter... The interior life of the soul is a filling of passions, and as the soul keeps knocking passions down, so each virtue takes its place in the soul, accompanied by degrees of grace. And according to how the virtues keep being perfected, so, do, so does grace administer its degrees to the soul. Here Jesus establishes an intimate relation between growth in the divine will and the exercise of the virtues. So you see, for those who say that when you live in the divine will, there's no more need for the Christian virtues, that's not true. They're intimately connected. The soul who desires to live in God's will must exercise the virtues and grow in the virtues. And the more the virtues are perfected, the more grace administers its degrees of growth to the soul in the divine will. On volume 36, June 12, 1938, Jesus reveals, When the soul operates in our will, the Trinity's will, we, the Trinity, receive such joy that we communicate this soul to all the blessed in heaven. It behooves you to know that for as many divine seeds the soul acquires by virtue of the knowledge of my fiat, so many more degrees of our knowledge and glory do we grant the soul. When having finished its life down here, it arrives at our heavenly homeland. To each divine seed of the knowledge of our divine will that the soul has acquired on earth corresponds a double knowledge of our supreme entity in our heavenly abode. To each divine seed 
a degree of glory, joy, and happiness is granted. So you see, God is telling Louisa that the more knowledge we acquire on earth of his eternal fiat, so many more degrees of knowledge and glory does he grant to us in the next life. And with each divine seed of the knowledge of his will that we acquire on earth, God will grant a double patrimony of participation in his supreme entity, in his heavenly abode. Now, why does he say heavenly abode, not heaven? Because the abode of God is above the heavens. God dwells, as the scriptures say, above the heavens. Scriptures say that God's abode is above the seraphim, it's above the cherubim, above the choirs of angels and the order of saints. And what does Jesus tell Louisa? Those who live in his will on earth, here below, will form part of a hierarchy that surpasses that of the angels and saints. It will be similar to the nine choirs of angels in as much as there will be different orders in this new hierarchy in heaven of souls who have lived in his, in his will according to how they lived so will they acquire the different orders so there will be in this new hierarchy in heaven of souls who live in his will on earth those who have lived in it imperfectly those who have lived in it perfectly and those who have lived in it completely you see and these orders will vary according to how we have lived in his will on earth. These orders that form this new hierarchy of the divine will in heaven will be determined by how we have lived in his will on earth. And again, I must share something with you that I shared with others. I don't know if I shared it on this program, though. I shared it in a retreat a few weeks ago. When speaking of this new hierarchy in heaven, Jesus tells Louisa that it is similar to the nine choirs of angels. Similar, okay? Inasmuch as there are different choirs or different orders of souls who have lived in his will on earth that will establish this new hierarchy in heaven. But he tells her that the different choirs of angels in heaven are determined by the different levels of knowledge that they were given by God. You see, God is the one who's given certain angels more knowledge than others. He tells her, and I will explain why God chooses of his own free will to give more knowledge to certain angels than others. But before I share that with you, let me quote you this passage I'm referring to from volume 35, August 9, 1937. The Trinity's love for Mary is so great that just as we, the Trinity, have our hierarchy of angels in heaven, as well as the vicarious order of saints, this great woman will call her own children to possess her inheritance, when our kingdom will be established on earth. We will give her the great glory of having her form the new hierarchy that will be similar to the nine choirs of angels. So she, Mary, will have the choir of seraphim, of cherubim, and so forth, as well as the new order of the saints who will have lived in her inheritance. That means lived in the divine will that she possessed on earth. After she will have formed them on earth, she will take them to her herself in heaven, surrounding herself with this new hierarchy which is the newborn souls in the divine fiat, reborn in her own love. So, where is Mary in heaven? She's right there in the heavenly abode with God. And she will have surrounding her this new hierarchy of souls who have lived in God's will on earth. And Jesus tells Louisa that, in volume 30, December 21st, 1931, these souls will form the new hierarchy of the heavenly homeland where there is a place reserved for them 
that no one else is permitted to occupy. Neither angels nor saints, but those who have lived in the divine will on earth. Now, why does God give to certain angels more knowledge of his will than others? Jesus gives us the answer in volume 17. October 30th, 1924. He tells Louisa, Do you know why there are different choirs of angels, one superior to the other? There are some which are closer to my throne, closer to my heavenly abode. And do you know why? It is because my will revealed itself in one single operation, but to some, my will was revealed with one single extension of knowledge and qualities, whereas to others, my will was revealed with two extensions, to some with three extensions, to others four extensions of my will, of knowledge and qualities, and so on up to the nine choirs. So these different extensions of knowledge Jesus is here speaking about establish and determine the different choirs of angels. There were one. There were, some was given. Some were given one extension of knowledge and qualities. Others two, up to nine. And he adds, with each addition, additional manifestation of the operation of my will that these angels received, some became superior to others, and the first ones more than the others were capable and more worthy of remaining closer to my throne, my heavenly abode. Okay, so this is something we don't consider. The nine choirs of angels were determined by God himself, not by the angels. So God predestined, as St. Paul says, some for greater intimacy and union with him and with his will than others, due to no fault of the others. So it is wrong for us to say that since this outpouring of God's will has been manifest in these end times, in this ulterior stage of divinization, we, therefore, are superior to the other saints that have not received this gift of living in the divine will. We are not superior to them. We are more blessed than them. We did nothing to merit this. So how are we superior when we did nothing to merit this gift? Rather, God, by his own free will, chose to impart this gift to us. We are the most blessed era, generation, of all humankind, we are the most blessed. And I would go so far as to say there will never be another generation, not even after us, as blessed as us, not even in the era of the divine will that has yet to be made manifest. We are the most blessed. Why? Because during the era that will follow this iniquitous generation, the era of peace that Mary spoke of at Fatima, the Eucharistic reign of Jesus, that the approved writings of Father Stefano Gobi speak of, the triumph of the Immaculate Heart era that St. Maximilian Kolbe speaks about, the second Pentecost that Popes John Paul II and uh, John XXIII spoke about. During these eras, during this future era, Satan will be enchained, as Revelation 20 relates. So the children of the kingdom of God's will on earth before the final coming of Christ, during this era of peace, which is symbolically referred to as a thousand years peace, that Pope John Paul II referred to as an encyclical as a millennium of unifications. They won't be as tested by Satan and by evil as we are, you see? So we will therefore acquire more merit because of the trials and tests that we endure than they will. We are the most blessed in terms of having to endure the greatest struggle of human history. And despite this greatest struggle, welcome the greatest gift. In the future era, they won't have this great struggle that we experience now. And for that reason, we can give God more glory than any other generation in human history. Jesus makes this clear to Louisa when he talks about how we on earth today 
can give God more glory than the angels and saints in heaven precisely because of our struggles. I'm going to pull up this passage for you. It's not always easy to pull up passages on the spur, you know, when um, you're dealing with over 15,000 pages um, of texts that Louisa wrote. And this comes from volume 7, May 9th, 1907. My daughter, the blessed in heaven give me much glory because of their perfect union with me. The perfect union of their wills with mine. For their life is a product of my will. There is so much harmony between us that their breath, inhalation, movements, and joys, and all that which constitutes their beatitude is the effect of my will. However, I tell you that for the soul who is still on earth and united to my will in such a way that it never deviates from it, its life is heavenly. And I receive from this soul on earth the same glory that I receive from the blessed in heaven, or rather, I take more pleasure and delight in this pilgrim soul on earth who lives in my will than the blessed in heaven. Because what the blessed in heaven do, they do without sacrifice and amidst delights. Whereas this pilgrim soul on earth, what it does, it does with sacrifice and amidst sufferings. And wherever there is sacrifice, I take more pleasure and I am more delighted. So you see, we are the most blessed generation of all human generations that ever were, that are, or ever will be. The only other generation that will be as blessed as us, I believe, will be at the very end of human history, when Satan will be released from his confinement for the final rebellion, before the final coming of Christ, which happens after the era of the divine will on earth, after the era of this thousand years peace. A thousand years is a symbolic number. It means a long period of time. It could be more than a thousand for all we know. It's a long period of time. It could be less than a thousand. We don't know. But what we do know is that this gift that has been outpoured and will remain outpoured till the final coming of Christ on earth, when we all receive the beatific vision, that is, those who have complied with God's will to the end, we will be the most blessed generation of all. And um, it will be because we have endured the greatest trials and have been given the greatest gift at the same time. The only other generation that will experience this, I believe, will be at the very end at the outpouring of evil at the final coming of Christ, right before the final coming of Christ in the flesh. And these two periods of outpouring of evil that correspond with the outpouring of God's greatest gift are re related in the book of Revelation in chapters 19, 20, 19 and 20, where it speaks of the false prophet and the beast that are active today. The beast represents all the nations working with Satan and against Christianity, and that we see today through the media, through social communication that's attacking the church. And we find it once again, after the era of peace, the era of the divine will, before the final coming of Christ. And these, this outpouring of evil is not referred to in the final manifestation as the false prophet and the beast, but as Gog and Magog. So the false prophet represents an individual, whereas the beast represents the nations working with that evil individual. Some church fathers refer to this evil individual as the Antichrist, okay? St. John refers to the Antichrist as anyone who denies the Trinity in his letter. John refers to the Antichrist as such. And in the end, in the final outpouring of evil, the evil individual is referred to as Gog. And this is a, an intimation of King Agag of the Old Testament who persecuted the church, the Old Testament Kahal. Gog is a, is a, is a um, word that comes from Ag, King Agag. And Magog are the nations that work with this evil individual, which will be in the future referred to as Gog. Now, the gift of living in the divine will sets us free 
protects us, even the places where we reside, despite all the evil around us. So we should have nothing to fear, but rather, with great trust, turn to God, to his mercy and his will. If we do our best, God will do the rest. Jesus tells this to Louisa. And with that, I'm out of time. May God bless you and keep you always united with him in his will. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.